This is your reality check. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Reality Check, the Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. I'm your host, Darren McKee, and with me, as usual, is Adam Gardner. What's up, Cuboids? And a special guest, Dr. Roman Yampolsky. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for being here. We're delighted to have uh, Dr. Yampolsky here, we might call him Roman, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Computer Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Louisville, where he's also the director of the Cybersecurity Laboratory. For many years, like well over a decade, he can tell us more, he's been exploring the various ways advanced artificial intelligence could be a threat to humanity. So I thought, hey, this might be a great person to talk about that very issue. Yeah. Welcome, Roman. I hope not to disappoint. <laughs> I'm sure you won't. Well, to give our listeners a little bit of context on our end, I, we've talked about this stuff a little bit on the show here and there. Over the past year, I've started to explore some some writing on my own about this. I think I've read about 30 books and various essays, some of which are uh, Romans. And so I pretty much agree with most of his uh, beliefs and statements, uh, but I still want to try to provide like the skeptical case for concerns about AGI or being uh, concerned about AI safety. And as such, I'll try to steel man those arguments wherever possible. So take this as, um, you know, <laughs> representative of hopefully a good discussion, but may not entirely my own beliefs. <laughs> yep. Okay. With that out of the way, I like to do basics and ensure everyone knows what we're talking about and trying to go step by step through this process. So why don't we start at the very basics? How would you define artificial intelligence? So artificial intelligence is our best attempt at uh, automating labor, physical, cognitive, basically getting machines to do whatever it is humans do. And when you say machines, do you, in your mind, think, is this software? Is this robots? Is this both? Well, uh, depends on if it's physical labor, you need a robot, right? You can just think about doing plumbing. But uh, for most interesting problems, software is sufficient usually. And a follow-up then is, what is the difference between, say, normal software and what you might consider artificial intelligence software? There is not much. At some point, I was trying to figure out what the smallest AI program would be, and it's basically an if statement. If it makes a decision, you have to give it some credit for being a tiny, intelligent piece of software. An if statement for people who aren't as up on the computer code. Uh, can you give an example of this, of what might be instantiated in some example of a program that would do that? So you're making a decision. If today is Tuesday, the lights go on. Uh, any any type of uh, decision usually can be reduced to a binary yes or no, zero or one. Okay. I mean, this. I mean, I, I think there's always you know gradations of things, and how you define things really depends on context. And it makes me think of longer debates where in discussions of say a conscious agent, then it like, well, is a thermometer or a heat pump, uh, you know, conscious? Like, well, not really, but it does detect something in the environment. And it makes a change based on that perception. And um, clearly, there's a difference in degree along these things. But as you're indicating, it's usually a difference of degree, not majorly a difference of kind. Right, and uh, you can probably find ways to defuzify it where you have a spectrum you can break it up into some binary points where okay this is at least this conscious this is at least uh, this conscious so Yes, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have brought in consciousness to confuse the whole thing because, um, well, I guess relatedly, um, now we can ask that point now, is consciousness a relevant part of your concerns about artificial intelligence or is it mm, a non-essential feature? It's not essential. We are worried about capability, decision-making, optimization powers. Consciousness comes in, then you talk about uh, rights for AI. Can it suffer? What can we do with it? What types of experiments? Can we shut it down? Uh, it's not really that important if I'm being chased by a Terminator or whatever, it feels anything before it kills me. Right. So in a way, um, the concern about consciousness is, is for the AI and less so for us <laughs> in a way. Um, okay. Uh, other terminology that people tend to use when they're talking about the risk of advanced artificial intelligence is artificial general intelligence or artificial super intelligence, or even sometimes people say transformative AI. I wondered how you uh, use these terms or how you understand and define them. Right. So there is a lot of terms, human level AI, uh, traditional AI, as it was envisioned in the uh, 50s and 60s. So uh, not really that important. There are some nuanced gradients, but really general just means it can do everything. It's not just playing chess 
or just driving a car, any of those skills that can pick up and learn like a human would. Hmm. Super intelligence is really beyond human capability in all those domains. So it will be a better chess player, better driver, better scientist, better engineer. And so under that definition, uh, so general would be sort of anything a human can do, the AI could do. And then the super, it's almost like a super general where everything general to a super degree. Is that is that correct? Right. And then we say anything a human can do, there is a nuance that most humans cannot do many things. So it's more like a super function of all humans combined. Yes, I've often thought this is a bit of a, a cheap move, right? Where mm -hmm. it used to be like, oh, anything a human can do. And you're like, oh, you mean <laughs> the best humans? And like, oh, we mean all of humanity. I'm like, well, that's kind of a, a bit of a moving goalpost sometimes. Uh, right. And that's a big difference because we humans are only general in the domain of human expertise. There is so many things we just don't know how to do at all. And AI mm -hmm. already knows how to do. So I think it's an important distinction if you really want to get into this. But for most people, it will make no difference whatsoever. <laughs> I, guess, I guess that's I guess that's true. Uh, and then because someone was probably curious, uh, how does all of this relate to the term the singularity? So that's the time then science fiction and science kind of become the same. It used to be that science fiction predicted technological advancements 100, 200 years in advance with submarines, TVs, internet. Uh, then it was maybe, you know, 50 years, we're going to have video phones and such. And now it's maybe a decade, we're kind of saying we're going to have this technology. Then science and science fiction happen at the same time. I think that's what this uh, singularity point is, where machines are the ones doing inventions, discoveries, research, engineering. And so we can't keep up. We cannot possibly understand what's going on. Uh, if right now, I don't know, iPhone comes out, new iPhone every couple of years, then it's every year, every month, every day, every second, you have a new iPhone and some crazy features on it. Right. It's almost like, well, as they say from the physics terminology, where we just don't know what happens after that, where we just can't understand what's going on. But to be fair, I, you know, don't fully understand what's going on now. <laughs> and I'm not sure that many people do. So I guess it's whatever we are currently experiencing now in terms of ignorance or confusion, just much, much worse. It's starting to feel like that. It's hard to keep up. Then I started work in AI safety. I could read every paper on that subject. Mm -hmm. then I could read all the good papers and now I can't read anything. So yeah, <laughs> we're getting pretty close to. Yeah. And it, like now I can barely write an AI to summarize it for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So you, you kind of hinted at some, some timelines, I guess, do you want to do timelines first or like, what are people actually concerned about? Cause I think maybe we should talk about what people are concerned about in general. AI is happening. It is a technology. Humanity's gone through many technologies. They often make our life better and sometimes worse, right? We have nuclear power, but nuclear weapons have increased uh, risks and threats in various ways, but people are going to get, you know, to make the case, like all sorts of advancements where now more, more people can make art or maybe more people can make, you know, a poem in the style of X person talking about Y thing that they never could have on their own. So, uh, what's the problem? So there are two camps. There are people who are concerned with existing technology kind of automating bad things humans do, like discrimination, like uh, technological unemployment. Uh, so it's already happening. It's definitely true. And we probably know how to make it better. So if there is some AI making decisions about employment, about uh, loans, uh, as an engineer, if you tell me that you want certain percentage of people to get hired, of certain representation, we know how to do that. The second group is concerned about kind of more advanced future AIs, which will take over all the cyber infrastructure, make all the important decisions for us. And we have no idea how to predict what they do, explain how they make those decisions and kind of control their decisions in a human friendly way. So that's uh, more of what I'm concerned with. The other two main camps. So maybe quickly going back to the first one, even though that's not the main purpose, the current issues. Well, the main discrimination is, is a great example um, because people are concerned about this, algorithmic fairness and bias and these sorts of things. And I agree with you that if people knew exactly what they wanted, 
they can probably get it. But from my understanding, especially um, I'm thinking of uh, Brian Christian's treatment of the compass issue, which relates to mm -hmm. judicial reviews of recidivism and other things, it seemed like there's inherently a trade-off between some things like, for example, fairness and accuracy. And depending on how you evaluate the AI, you kind of get one or the other, which then a different group might see as fine and fair and the other group will not see. And um, these things are just not reconcilable. Um, what do you think about stuff like that? There are mathematical proofs showing you cannot remove all bias. It's impossible. And we definitely don't agree on what fair is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In a way, we probably don't need to go to math to figure that one out. <laughs> but there is uh, awesomely like three different papers came out around the same time proving that you just can't do that. And people still try. Well, God bless their hearts, eh? <laughs> I'm sure all the people concerned have read all the math. Uh, uh, okay, so to the other one, the larger, you know, some larger um, AGI or something like that taking over, as you said, cybersecurity infrastructure, I think what would really help a lot of people is trying to think through this like step by step with some, it doesn't have to be a definitive concrete example, but maybe a couple concrete examples, like how, how exactly would this happen, right? So currently we say we have chat GPT or we have other AI systems. How does it go from something we can ask get a question and it tells us something to then really being somehow a threat to humans or even humanity? Well, there is a lot of different ways it could be dangerous depending on what technology, depending on what stage we're at. So if it controls infrastructure, if it's uh, already in charge of nuclear power plants, airline industry, stock market, just uh, think about the accidents we're starting to see. So a flash crash in the stock market wiping out a trillion dollars or something like that. If we talk about language models, maybe it helps write uh, source code for some important project and we just didn't do a good job debugging it or the bugs are very different from what we anticipate from human programmers. So there is a fundamental bug in a mission crucial system, a nuclear response, for example. You're thinking a bug that was intentionally put there by a malicious AI or a bug that was just unforeseeable because we don't really understand what that AI is doing? All of it. So one, yeah. you have just mistakes because it's kind of making up stuff at this point. So it mm -hmm. will just have a bug and not realize it like a human programmer. Mm -hmm. It may think that for whatever reason, it needs to be there. There could be a malevolent human who instructed it to have a hidden backdoor of some kind. Really, like any type of uh, reason you can come up with is actually a legitimate reason. Someone can do it. And I always argue with people who say, no one will ever do it. It sounds insane. And I go, I will do it just to prove you wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, so that, um, uh, that's, that's a great point. It also gets to the history of people saying, you know, this will never happen. And then, of course, something does happen. And yeah. sometimes it happens quite quickly that people aren't prepared for. Um, there's a couple of different threads to pick up on. The most recent one about when people say something won't happen, uh, and this goes to timelines. It seems like there's a wide range of beliefs of the timelines of when something like an AGI or an AGI as a threat will come into existence. Uh, you have a certain percentage of researchers. I mean, the surveys are tricky to look at because they're usually small samples, but some of them say never, like truly never or a hundred years. And other people are saying, yes, it's, it's 10 years away. So from the outside, it seems really peculiar that there's this much um, difference in opinion about when things are going to happen. And I was trying to think, are there even other domains? I don't know if it's like military strategy or whatnot. Like what other field in the world where there's this disparate uh, level where, and like movie reviews, like some critic loved it, some people hated it, but it's not really the same thing. It's almost like I love this restaurant and someone else says it's going to poison everyone. I So I was wondering how you think about timelines and also what your personal sense of timelines are. Yeah, so I never understood people who said never. That just requires some magical ingredient, which is not part of like physical matter and hardware. So I guess if you have deeply held religious, spiritual beliefs, maybe that would explain it. But anything else is actually not that different. If someone says five years, someone says 20, 25 years, does it make any difference whatsoever? It's within our lifetime. And it's just as big of a problem. We still need to do something about it. So I don't think it's as big of a difference as you uh, suggest it was um, to kind of answer your comparison question. I think consciousness is another one where people are kind of saying that we'll never understand it. Uh, we, we will have it when we have AGI. So the same type of distribution of answers. 
Okay, so that's useful. So maybe if I can sort of say that back to you, given the uh, significance of the event of something like AGI or uh, artificial superintelligence, whether it's five years or 25 years doesn't really matter much, especially say in the span of human history or because most of us will still be alive at the same time. That said, of course, it really does matter whether it's five years or 25 years, given um, a our ability to prepare for something like that to better or to make it likely to do something better than worse. And or if it's bad, of course, uh, living longer is better. Does that make sense? Uh, absolutely. So short term for financial reasons, for many reasons, yeah, you might care if it's five or 20. But from safety, existential risk point of view, mm -hmm. It matters if problem is solvable and we feel like having extra five to 10 years would make all the difference. If you think that problem may be unsolvable to begin with, then it doesn't really matter from that point of view. Okay. So I definitely want to come back to the solvability, but first, do you um, have any timelines in your head and you can even do the, you know, I think it's 50% likely by X date, or is it just kind of a, I think it's going to be soon and I don't really know how to say otherwise. I never do predictions independently. I kind of trust other people who invested time in it. I always liked what Trey Kurzweil did. 2045 was his kind of most likely. Mm -hmm. 2023 was like crazy soon. So somewhere in between those two. If I recall, uh, Kurzweil said, um, yeah, about 2045 for like, you know, the singularity type stuff. But I think he said, was it 2029 for human level? And if that's true for me, if we're at human level in 2029, I don't see 16 years uh, from human level to like, you know, crazy bonkers time. Yeah, what's it doing in that time? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hiding, yes. Mm -hmm. I think he was looking at like uh, amount of compute to simulate a single brain versus mm -hmm. all of humanity. And I think 2023 is where we have enough compute for a single brain now. Yes. And the, the dark joke where like, well, the AI is like, well, if we reduce the number of people, there's less compute according to humanity. <laughs> so you can cross that line sooner. Um, regarding whether it's solvable, uh, it seems, uh, given that even, okay, what I want to say is that even though some problems seem unsolvable, it's sometimes really hard to know if that's truly the case. Uh, so it seems like on, on a rational move that why don't we try or act as if it is solvable until it seems really clear that it is not. I wondered how you approached it. So I, uh, try to kind of define control in different ways. And mm -hmm. I came up with four different uh, levels of control. So you have direct control where you give orders, just explicit orders that follows it. Uh, it's kind of like the genie stories. You have three wishes, you wish for something, and then you always regret it. Yes. You use your second wish to undo your first wish, and the third one completely screws you. So the problem there is uh, without applying some sort of interpretation, domain-specific knowledge, context, common sense, direct orders will backfire for sure. So I think pretty much everyone would agree that under that definition, control is not possible. So that's direct control. When you say backfire for sure, uh, do you mean like really likely or always? Because of ambiguities in human language, okay. it's pretty much guaranteed if you use it like more than once, uh, you'll start accumulating problems. And depending on what you use it for, they may be quick and significant. You may get lucky and your first couple of wishes will just get you something silly. Okay. So that was direct control and you mentioned there are four. What's uh, number two? So at the other end of that extreme, is a uh, kind of ideal advisor. You are not in control. You trust the system to be better than you, smarter than you. It knows about you. It has a perfect model of you, and it knows exactly what you want. So it doesn't even ask for your input. It just knows what needs to happen next. So you may be safe and you may be happy, but you're definitely not in control in that scenario. Okay. And then it's whether you, as you said, usually in this case, I assume you voluntarily at least start gave up control. And now it's uh, maybe the best world you can be in, even though you might be resentful, but it's still better than not having the AI help you. Right. So you kind of realized it's always right. All the decisions that made were superior to yours. So you just kind of give up trying and trust the system to know better. Uh, again, you may be very happy depending on what it does, but you cannot claim to be in control since you are not even a participant in a decision-making process. Although I guess if you can somehow still stop it or shut it down, for lack of a better phrase, you have some control. 
So undo kind of undo button is a desirable feature. If you <laughs> yes. surrender decision making for long enough, you cannot undo it. You just don't know how to run the system anymore. You mean you can't just hit Control Z ten times? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, and what are the uh, other types of control? And they're mixed kind of between the two. So you have a system which is not just following orders directly, but kind of tries to understand what you meant by it. And the other one is a value alignment, uh, as described, where the system has a pretty good model of you. It uh, tries to do exactly what you mean when you give orders. So it doesn't follow explicit uh, linguistic interpretation of what you said, but kind of, oh, when you say you want a hot girl, you don't mean she's going to be like warm. You mean... <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And even the, you know, can you pass the salt means please pass me the salt, not whether you are able to or not. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So it's uh, much better than the dumber two, but not as uh, ignoring you completely as the ideal advisor. And, and, and the idea here is if it is super intelligent, it knows everything better than you so it, it, sh it shouldn't have a flaw in its logic that it that it's going to make a mistake there right so the problem here comes from a us not knowing what we want hmm. not having consistent values they change all the times and they're self-contradictory and there is eight billion other agents just human agents who all want something else at the same time Yes. Uh, yeah. So this is where we're starting into, I believe, what often is called the alignment problem. So I guess to the to the point of Adam, though, even if the advisor is uh, imperfect, um, like say in a just a reasonability measure, mm. it's probably still better than most humans. But because it's so capable, it's much more of a risk. That's one thing we could say. Mm. And then if you could elaborate more on, I guess if we're trying to imagine, is it one AI, like AGI or ASI or sort of artificial superintelligence that's doing this or many, um, if people have their own assistant, mm -hmm. then it's okay if um, there's a bit, at least some differences amongst people, uh, but as you're going to say, but they're often in conflict and then what do you do? So if you could speak more about the difficulties with uh, alignment, that'd be useful. Right. So if there is more than one AI or superintelligence, that just makes things more complicated. It's never easier to control 8 billion superintelligences than to control one. Mm -hmm. uh, 8 billion people are a problem because they compete for the same resources and then two different requests are placed for the same location, person, financial resources. There is going to be some sort of a conflict and resolution of that conflict could be problematic for both parties. Uh, again, we don't have a solution for it. After a millennia of research on ethics and morality, we have not agreed on anything so far. We have um, sort of slightly agreed, right, in a way, like different pockets of the world have sort of agreed on some things. Oh, yeah, but, pockets, yes. If you yeah. go local, like your family can probably do okay, but again, 8 billion people out yeah, of pocket. So. And of course, you know, not maybe your family at Christmas or Thanksgiving, depending on your family. <laughs> extended family is worse. Yeah, well, yeah, your extended family. Well, even, you know, sometimes you have siblings like, wow, you managed to have completely different beliefs than me. That's interesting. <laughs> I guess it's, um, yeah, I also, I'm, I guess I'm really trying to, uh, again, provide the other side that people would say, okay, look, yes, most of the world is not democratic, but there are some. And yes, there are different degrees in belief and support in, say, equality or the ability mm -hmm. to vote or freely assemble. And people largely agree on these things in certain places places is the is the complication so to speak that say if there is one like asi or agi that in some parts of the world we think you know everyone should be able to vote and in another part they say people shouldn't at all and i want those preferences to extend beyond my borders yeah. and that's an example of the conflict so this is kind of what we deal with right now without ai just as humans Mm -hmm. But uh, again, uh, take any sort of limited resource where you can just make more of it. How would that be decided? I don't know. There's been religious wars. There is economic wars. Whatever it's oil, holy cities, uh, waterfront properties. Uh, how are you going to satisfy multiple agents? You either have to sacrifice preferences of one agent or both agents. Basically, nobody gets it. It's nobody's or just you get it. So at any uh, point, you have to either deny a request or sacrifice preferences of one of the agents. That that makes sense. Um, 
that said, most of us are uh, used to living in some sort of, you know, pluralistic, pluralistic society where there's compromise and we somehow like we sort of get along, I guess is what I'm trying to say. We, we have managed to uh, have decent lives in not every part of the world and not even within every country, of course, but it sort of seems to work. I guess what I'm trying to say, is it truly going to be doom uh, entirely or is it like, look, it'll be a compromise suboptimal thing that is so here's decent. here's why it works. Uh, all humans are very similar in our power and our mm. ability to influence the world. Mm -hmm. So even the worst human, if they really tried, they're going to kill, you know, hundreds, thousands, maybe millions. They don't have capability to do much worse. Whereas here you have a system which can do much worse and even trivial decisions could be amplified to much greater impact. I guess, you know, depending on who, who gets to launch which nukes, um, the, some humans could cause a massive amount of damage. But I take your point that most people don't have the capability to do a dramatic uh, impact in the world. Right. Imagine picking a random human and giving them, like, complete power, absolute power. How bad would it get very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's some movie, <laughs> if not, or some Akira, story. kind of. There's, there's, there's probably a bunch. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. As you highlight these problems, um, do you think this is, do you think this is unsolvable? This particular uh, misalignment among people? Uh, there are solutions, but they may be crazier than the problem we're trying to deal with. So one solution I proposed is uh, switching to virtual worlds. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets their own virtual universe. You don't have to compromise. We just have to figure out how to control the baseline it's running on the substrate where all the universes are host and uh, how that is decided. But once you have your own personal universe, you you can wish for whatever you want. Okay, so that's, I mean, that's a very interesting idea. I want to unpack that a bit. I want to think of even how we might get there. So we've largely been talking about the negative aspects of advanced AI. Yeah. Uh, there is a, you know, a plausible future. Maybe it's not the most likely one, but it's definitely one where the AI helps us, you know, become more abundant and resource rich in various ways. And a lot of people end up having a, a better standard of living. So at least in the near term, uh, more preferences will say are satisfied or well-being goes up uh, on average say in a global sense which is good because i was thinking yes you could have you could try to have eight billion people in vr but that means you know eight billion vr headsets and that's nowhere near uh, the infrastructure that we currently have available for such a thing oh, right so not uh, today but the long-term solution may be exactly that instead of trying to make this universe uh, the single physical universe satisfy different sets of preferences we can simulate with generative ai virtual worlds where your preferences are exactly what you want it to be and it, it doesn't have to be some sort of utopia you may have a very challenging universe unpleasant universe in fact some people say that's exactly where we are right now Yes. <laughs> yes. That's another wrinkle. And I'm, I mean, as you've said elsewhere in other conversations, I know that that kind of works as long as everyone is okay with someone in a different virtual world doing whatever they want, even if it might uh, offend their current sensibilities. Much like now, some people really don't like what freely consenting adults do with their time for one reason or another, even though it seems to have no real effect on them because of notions of I don't know, fundamental values, purity or other concerns. Right. But as long as you control the substrate and somehow the superintelligence manages to keep them separate, it's like we live in a multiverse and we have absolutely no access to universes outside of our light cone, right? Like we just can't impact them in any way. Right. And I, I mean, I'm not saying this isn't like a decent solution. Again, it's always compared to what, right? I don't necessarily yeah. like, you're like, well, that's not going to work. You're like, well, compared to what? Nothing, right? <laughs> um, but we can also acknowledge, as you said before, people have different preferences. And I'm sure if there was some alien life somewhere, people wouldn't like something that those alien lives do, <laughs> like somewhere else in the galaxy, even if it had no effect on them, just because it's, uh, you know, again, offending their notions of purity or something else like that. Right. And it's definitely something to consider. But again, if you're fully simulating their experience, maybe you can fool them into thinking that there is no others and they're the only ones in the universe. Oh, well, yes. Then it goes to a bit of a, you know, is, is deception part of this? Um, do people freely choose and then they're, you know, they don't remember what's happened? Like, you know, being plugged back into the matrix? Like It so has to be. Otherwise, it just, I don't think it would work if you know it's always fake. Uh, you make a decision, you may have uh, this type of contract where you can at random points reevaluate your decision. So you're not like fooled by the demo and then have to 
live in that crappy <laughs> universe forever. But uh, As the I, I think it's up. absolutely necessary that you don't remember entering the simulation. Yeah, yes. I mean, people sort of find value in interacting with other people who they assume to be other independent agents like them, right? So if they if they think everything in their world is simulated, they may just not find meaning in life. It may just feel like a sort of never-ending single-player video game, right? Right. And uh, you can make it where it's some sort of mixed situation. You can visit other universes with consent and, you know, mm -hmm. that's also possible. But uh, again, the main idea is to figure out if the problem with multiple agents, uh, multivariate alignment is so obviously impossible how can we reduce it to a single agent problem which may be solvable it's still difficult you're mm -hmm. still not the same person at different time points you disagree with yourself but it's way easier than doing it with you know multi-agent setup yes if you only have yourself to deal with and not numerous other people it does simplify the problem and does this scenario if taken to its sort of extreme kind of mean the end of society either everyone lives forever in their own little universe or if people die they never really procreate and like there's sort of an end unless there's there's sort of a, a higher level where people continue to coexist and mingle together so i don't have the whole thing solved and coded yet mm -hmm. <laughs> uh it, it seems that you can do lots of things once you have uploads especially you can sure. have infinite uh, existence or at least as long as the hardware is running you can definitely try kind of merged uh, situations where if a few agents agree on something for some amount of time, they can be combined in one simulated sure. pocket. But again, I, I think I published that paper and there was not much follow-up since then. So there is a lot of room for additional research in that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, so if I may just sort of go through um, sort of the, the logic chain of this uh, for the listeners is that in the future, say, uh, maybe it's, you know, decades and decades away where we have the technology to have everyone in a virtual space that is either predicated upon or assumes that then again, there's global technological development where everyone has all this technology and they can somehow be kept alive. Or as you said, they could be uploaded. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like the first bit. And then if they could be uploaded, that of course assumes that the mind, the brain, consciousness, whatever you might want to call it, can be almost like, you know, a pattern of neurochemical activity that can be replicated in a machine. And if you don't happen to have those assumptions, then it doesn't quite work. Right. If consciousness is really a soul and God created this whole thing, then none of it's going to work well. Right. Right. Okay. So, um... I'd like to go back a bit to the, the various issues with control, because um, it's one thing to say uh, we have a, a more like a tool use, right? We're trying to get the AI to do something, and it, it kind of does what we want, or um, it, uh, it it's doing what we want, but in a bad way, or as you said, there's code there. I'm not thinking of malicious intent right now. This is sort of accidental stuff. But it does seem that many people might talk about this. There's a very... Um, agent aspect of it like the ai seems to have uh, almost its own motivations or its own desires and that does seem to be a different type of thing and i think for a lot of people they can kind of understand ai as as the tool more so but how does it like and, and it sort of you can give to me tell me a story about how concretely does it sort of come to have its own preferences for lack of a better phrase so there is something called ai drives if you want to be an agent in this world and you want to accomplish your goals, there are some side goals you need to have. So instead of terminal goals, you have instrumental goals such as I need to exist. I need to still be alive. I need to make sure my brain is not messed with. My utility function is not corrupt. I have resources. It's always good to accumulate resources. Whatever my goals will be in the future, it's good if I'm rich. And there is a few others, but uh, the general idea is that now you have an agent which is interested in self-preservation, accumulation of Bitcoin, and uh, protection of its uh, body. Yeah, I, I appreciate the, the, I guess, the rationale there. If you could try to unpack it even in more detail, that it want like it, it wants to keep alive, like even this language, because if it's AI software. As far as I understand, it's still trying to, we'll say, maximize its reward function, which is usually something like increasing the number in some file somewhere, some spreadsheet somewhere, because that's kind of at root what's going on. Is that fair or no? It is, but then I need to make sure that the computer in which the file is stored is protected. 
I need to make sure that electricity is still running. And most likely, the reason it will stop doing it is humans. That makes sense to me too. I guess maybe another way of phrasing it is that um, the AI, it's simply enough for an advanced AI to act as if it has intentions in a way, much like we treat some humans uh, or other organisms or even, you know, intentional stance going back to Dennis stuff, which I like that you treat something as if it acts towards a certain goal when at root, it is kind of doing something more uh, basic or almost uh, physical input output stuff. Uh, so you can analyze uh, motivation from different angles, from game theory, from some sort of emotional uh, mapping to human uh, preferences. But uh, I think if you have sufficiently advanced system with goals, and those goals could be anything, human given, randomly generated, doesn't matter. If it's sufficiently smart, it will figure out those additional drives. It has to, otherwise it just fails competition with other systems. And a lot of it is actually created by evolutionary computation, competition, adversarial neural networks, where if you're not doing it, you are not the one released into the wild. So it's very likely that the system will end up at the top, which has those drives, those evolutionary economic preferences for survival, for self-protection, for as a side effect of it, for destroying its enemies. That's also very useful. Um, mm -hmm. If I can sort of say that back to you, because I really think this is a sticking point. That's why I'm kind of sticking on it. That yes, I agree. Once it is sufficiently smart, it would make sense that it wants to exist. It's going to try to say protect itself. It's going to try to get more resources. It's going to do various things to try to ensure its uh, goals are achieved. I guess I want to focus back on that sufficiently smart. And you hinted at that where as we develop these things more and more, the ones that the AIs that humans may want to use more are increasingly getting smarter or more capable. Mm. And is it kind of that as such, it, the AIs keep getting smarter, more capable. And by definition, the ones that become uh, used more are ones that have this, uh, we'll say ability to think more broadly, so to speak, I'm using lo terms loosely here, to use more resources, to think more creatively, to achieve goals. And that just sort of continues. And then eventually it becomes uh, more of a threat. Well, at this stage, we humans are the designers, intelligent designers. It's not purely evolutionary process. It's not independent. Once it hits level of human engineer and scientist, it takes over. It lo no longer needs us to provide this detailed feedback and market selection. But so far, I think we're still doing it. Yes. When it hits that level, I, I agree the logic you're saying, but like, how does it like literally, how does it happen? So now we've developed, say, I don't know, chat GPT that can somehow edit its code. Is a human like allowing it to do that initially where it says like, Hey, help me modify code. I'm just kind of get the, where does almost the desire for the AI to edit its own code before it's smart enough to want to edit its own code. You know what I'm trying to get at here? Well, right now there are market pressures. There are companies which want to be first to AGI, so they're encouraging this type of behavior. I wrote a paper about malevolent AI design where people do it on purpose. Hackers, crazy people, doomsday cults will work very hard to create this most, uh, most dangerous system. Uh, you can look at any one of those possible uh, sources for this type of uh, software, but it seems like there is pressure to to get to that point. Okay, I think the especially the you know the hackers is a whole other ball game, so to speak. There's people who just mm -hmm. create viruses and release them into the world, and they cause harm, and that's what they want to do because it's uh, entertaining or they're trying to achieve some other goal. And I'm aware, as you, you're more aware than we are, of uh, numerous examples where even someone created a virus and it kind of got away from them, and it did even more damage than they might have anticipated. So those are um, definitely obvious cases. It's uh, was really just trying to concretely think through how exactly do you get from like A to B in this quirky situation. Right, and predicting specific future developments and how long they will take are uh, the hardest part. Nobody's going to give you precise pathways and precise dates for that. The general direction seems to be more obvious because there's so many paths all kind of meeting there. Whatever we evolving those systems or explicitly designing them or they are self-improving or they all kind of heading to the same point of capability. I, I fully like the trend lines. Yes. They all seem to be going in one particular direction. <laughs> um, it's also that, um, cause it, you've talked to numerous people about this and I want to sort of get into why you think other people like don't agree with this or don't believe it. Um, it seems like people, uh, especially, you know, people aren't in the domain of AI research at all kind of want, give me a really concrete example 
And of course, that leads to something called the conjunction fallacy, where the more detail I give you about a scenario, the less likely that particular scenario is to occur, mm -hmm. but it definitely helps someone's imagination. And so it seems like there's this trade-off to provide enough information so someone can consider what you're saying plausible or reasonable. Like, okay, yeah. I can see, you got to give me something to work with, I don't know, greater economic power, and then we uh, allow AI to be in charge of municipal infrastructure, and then something, something, versus just saying, AI is going to be a problem, which of course is more likely than anything with detail, but then you're like, well, I don't, I don't have anything imaginatively to go on, so I, they don't believe you. Mm -hmm. So already we surrendered control of pretty much all infrastructure to software not AGI, not AI, just software, right? Mm -hmm. That's what's controlling all the power plants, airlines, we just saw a big, big problem with airline control by software. Uh, but uh, if you have capability upgrades, this new system comes and it makes it more efficient. Mm -hmm. That's what happens, software gets upgraded. So that's how those systems get placed in charge of all the infrastructure we currently use. A lot of times we don't fully understand what capabilities those systems already have. So we're not talking about maybe in the future it will be capable. It's possible that today it's capable, we're just not prompting it in the right way. Yes, and maybe you might have in mind for listeners, uh, you know, various uh, interactive chat bots, you can ask it questions and it may do decently answering. But then if you ask it, oh, in your response, can you kind of reason through step by step? This prompt, for whatever reason, helps the AI answer better. And that was just sort of unleashing what I want to say, like a latent possibility that was always there. All right. So when you were uh, making these conversations, cause I, you know, you've been, you correct me if I'm wrong, you've been at this for over a decade. And but, when I look at uh, some of your work from, you know, 2014, 2015, or when Nick Bostrom's book, super intelligence came out in 2014, mm -hmm. the AI landscape has changed. So I kind of want to ask you how you think things have changed, but it also seems like people are discussing similar issues. Uh, do you think, basically, do you think more people are aware in a good way? Uh, have things gotten better? Have things uh, been any more likely to be solved? There is definitely more people who know about potential problems. There is definitely more full-time AI safety researchers. Many companies have an AI safety team now. That that was not the case 10 years ago. It was pure science fiction. Now it's actual research area, there are conferences, you get paid really well, uh, it's legitimate. Uh, but at the same time, the development community likewise exponentially grew. The funding is in billions, uh, governments are interested in this technology, so it, it accelerated. If it was uh, not doing so well, maybe we would have more time to kind of consider those options and uh, find a more promising in terms of safety pathway to get to that technology. Whereas right now we're just doing whatever works. If tomorrow somebody says, okay, this new algorithm has higher performance, that's what everyone's deploying, training as much as they can. Maybe they'll get there first. That's the approach. Uh, even companies where the CEO is well aware of safety risks, they have a safety team. The policy is to kind of figure it out, then we get there. In what sense, if any, do you think that the greater awareness of AI safety issues has somehow made it worse for the development of AGI or ASI, which might be a threat? So it's a very complex issue and it's very hard to tell whatever something was uh, a positive or negative force in this direction. I can think of examples where effective altruist uh, funding agencies gave money to companies like OpenAI, mm -hmm. which uh, you can easily say was done to help them develop their safety technology, better study AI, but uh, the side effect was that they are pushing this technology faster than anyone else. So is it a positive or negative uh, move? Uh, history will tell. Yes. Well, let's, <laughs> let's hope it's one more than the other. Uh, if you were to um, sort of try to take the opposite stance to your, to your own ideas and your work, what do you think is the strongest objection to to your beliefs and your claims? Or uh, alternatively, what do you think is the weakest part of your beliefs and argument? So I, I have recently published a paper which is a review of uh, skeptical arguments against AI risk. So AI risk uh, skepticism or AI risk denialism, depending on how you want to see it. And uh, the only 
really strong objection uh, I found is if you believe there is something beyond the Neumann architecture, you need something special and uh, maybe kind of magical, godlike soul thing to, to get to truly general superintelligence. Under every other scenario, if you believe we get there, whatever it's five years, 20 years, you now have a system smarter than anyone with completely alien preferences, still subject to all the malevolent actors who, who are humans for whatever reason, military, hackers, crazy, cults. So they would use it uh, for malevolent purposes. It has the same uh, AI drives I described, which cause it to be very territorial, let's put it this way. And um, if there was a convincing argument against my position, I would switch sides. Mm -hmm. Right. And I guess maybe relatedly, you can let me know if you already addressed it. What are you most uncertain about in this domain? So it's very difficult to judge whatever something is actually a breakthrough and we close or it's completely nothing sandwich. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we had uh, AlphaGo. Then we had Watson uh, do really well in Jeopardy, right? Defeat humans mm -hmm. in this general question answering. To me, it felt like it was a big deal. Now, nobody remembers those accomplishments. Well, remembers, but nobody thinks it was like something, complete game changer. And now with uh, GPT, it also feels like it's very important, but I wonder if, uh, you know, five years from now, it will be another spell checker. Hmm. That's, a, that's a great point. Because certainly when Watson happened, uh, from what I understand, like they definitely didn't want to, <laughs> sorry, Watson is Jeopardy, but when that Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov, I think it was 97 or so, hmm. um, they definitely didn't want to play again. They just like <laughs> disassembled the computer and <laughs> IBM stock went up and that was a good move for IBM. And then for Watson, they're like, oh, it'll help in medicine. And I think it they tried it and it didn't seem to really work well. Uh, and then the AlphaGo stuff, you know, AlphaGo Zero and so on, this is the, you know, the AI was able to beat Lee Sedol, the Go champion, and like a staggering situation, it was an upset. And then, you know, within a, within a year or so, AlphaGo Zero played against itself 30 million times and then beat everyone, they beat itself, so to speak, the best in the world in like an hour or a couple days or something ridiculous. So you're right, it, it's, it's the way I've seen it, and you can let me know if I'm wrong, it, it, from the outside, because I'm not, you know, a machine learning researcher or anything like that. The more progress we make in these narrow domains, like, oh, first it can play chess and then, you know, go and then maybe this game diplomacy and then maybe a bit of Starcraft. And if you just keep adding up enough narrow domains, it seems like someone should just be able to combine them. And then you get something like an AGI. And that's why all that progress does still matter because it can be mm, transported over. Does that make sense? I don't think you can just add them, like put different apps on the same Windows machine and that will get you there. They have to be able to work together. They have to transfer information. So you'll get something like a human level simulator for non-science, non-invention domain. If you think about like a typical human being who just, you know, average intelligence, uh, average job, we're not talking science, geniuses right we're not talking einsteins so like a very very average person doesn't write books doesn't read papers so we can get there with this kind of addition though you want to play chess i'll play chess with you go for a ride go for a ride that system would not invent the next paradigm of new technology mm -hmm. right and then related to that, I think I just saw Elon Musk made a comment of like, well, you know, wait till this stuff like discovers new physics or something. And I thought, well, that's a good goalpost move where it used to be, you know, human level. Like, well, most humans haven't discovered new physics either. Not yet. Not yet. Indeed. I mean, we're kind of in a bubble. We're used to people having interest in this topic and philosophical discussions. But then you actually encounter real humans on the street. Uh, they are not aware of most of it. It's not a problem they are even aware of, much less concerned about or trying to solve. So definitely we moved the goalposts. Yeah. Now it's like if it's not smarter than the smartest human, is it even AI? Yeah, which I think, mm -hmm. you know, I understand that move and, you know, people will do that uh, for various incentives. I also think when I hear that, I think someone put a chat GPT through the SATs and it got 52nd percentile. And so some people say like, it's only 52nd. I'm like, 
that's better than so many people. Like, <laughs> let's not be too insulting here. That that's that's better than what a lot of people are capable of. Now, the SAT. Most of people is, never take the SATs. They don't plan to go to college. They never graduated high school. We live in this bubble of like <laughs> insanity. That's true. A bias sample within a bias sample, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, I know the test was designed for humans and not AI, but I also thought like, come on, like, oh, it's only better than a couple billion people. You're like, well, okay, <laughs> that's that's not nothing, everyone. So, um, like, admittedly, you're you're you've laid out a lot of problems, and it doesn't seem like there's that many uh, solutions. <laughs> so, I wondered what you think we should do about this. Not like anyone's actually listening to me, but <laughs> well, slowing, we are right now. Everyone's slowing, ready. Slowing down would be a smart move. Trying to okay. figure out what it is we're actually doing. It would make sense with any other dangerous technology. I think we did it with human cloning, which is also very financially beneficial, marketable capability to have. So it's possible. But because it's so difficult to control, like someone can just do it on their laptop in their garage and there is nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. Just government regulation by itself seems pointless. So my hope was to convince people who are smart enough to develop this technology to uh, understand that it will not benefit them. It will backfire greatly. The problem now is that the intelligence necessary to develop it seems to be going down. Now you need money for compute. Right. So more and more people are capable of doing it. And they may not be smart enough to understand the consequences. Right. If if it is um, just by needing more computational power or things scale, as they say, um, it becomes easier and easier to do this sort of thing. As you said, like it's not quite the case that people can just do it on their computer, maybe once the product is finished. But of course, you need smart people who really know what they're doing with millions of dollars to train these things and uh, have them up and running and work in the first place. To your same point, then, I guess, you know, trying to convince people that it might backfire, uh, it seems like there's a parallel there from, you know, people within a country to globally, where then you're one or we are going to try to convince people in other countries, like, well, look, don't race against each other because it's not that you're going to get an advantage. It's just that um, you may, but it's going to backfire on you as well. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's uh, like prisoner's dilemma or anything like that. You you want the benefits and it's very hard to coordinate. It's very difficult and people don't even agree that there is a possibility of danger. There are people who uh, honestly argue that it can only be good. There is no possibility of it being anything but nice because it's so smart. Okay. So uh, understanding all of this, we're not going to say what we think is something that's going to succeed, but what is the least bad option is to somehow get, is this, I'm just putting, asking a question to you, a coalition of say government regulators, uh, companies and civil society to agree on trying to slow some of this stuff down and constrain who has access. So, so again, it depends on how difficult the problem turns out to be. If it requires something like Manhattan Project resources, we can monitor compute, we can monitor spending, you can regulate that size project. If it's something where you just need a new formula, like somebody goes, oh, E equals MC square, let me try it on my laptop, then your regulation doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Although, I mean, you happen to pick, you know, E equals MC squared nicely relates to the Manhattan Project. And to actually get use out of that equation, um, you need, you know, lots and lots of resources. But I, I take your point that if it some, somehow has become a lot easier. Than we don't know control. what the formula is. So we keep discovering yeah. new things which work and they are somewhat complex. The transformer is a complex model, but there could be simplifications we haven't found yet. So um, then I guess relatedly... Um, because I don't want to ask you what are your projections for AI in the next, you know, one to five years, but sort of related to that is what type of work will you try to do in the next one to five years on this? Is it just trying to promote the message of we should think more about this and maybe slow things down? So for the last couple of years, I've been publishing different uh, safety relevant impossibility results, limits on explainability of black box neural networks, limits on predictability problems with ambiguity of human language in terms of giving orders. Uh, I have a few of those uh, still in a pipeline, so that's what I'm working on. Hopefully somebody reads them and it will convince them. Uh, really just highlighting more and more the problems that we're trying to deal with here. 
Well, specifically in possibility results. So I'm not saying like, uh, listen, we need to understand how this works. It's difficult. Let's put more money in it. I'm saying it's impossible for lower level intelligence to completely, fully comprehend the more complex system, control it, remain in charge indefinitely. Uh, we can show it through size differences in memory, in parameters, in uh, speed. There is a lot of uh, solid physical evidence that cannot be done. So, I mean, as depressing as it might be, that sounds like that might be the outcome. Uh, is there um, another world, so to speak, where I know I think certain organizations are trying to pursue that? Well, why don't we develop AIs that can help us develop better AI? And I wondered what you thought about the approach of trying to use it as a tool to help us design a better version of a future AGI versus something that gets away from us, so to speak. So open AI is using that approach, right? But it feels like it's a bit of a catch-22. It's AI safety complete problem. You need a safe uh, AI to help you design a safe AI. You cannot use a malevolent AI to help you create a safe AI, at least uh, not in any verifiable way. Well, is it, I take your point, but is it a way to currently have, as you said, if, if um, it's sort of like humans are more capable once we use our tools, right? And uh, can we use the AI as a tool to then deal with the, the better AI? Are you just saying, well, you don't think that's promising or you think, well, we might as well give it a shot because. I think it increases problem. complexity that you're saying, let's have this chain from human to slightly smarter AI to slightly smarter AI all the way to super intelligence. And it's much harder to control hundred different level complex systems than controlling one. So it, it feels like you're trying to smuggle safety somewhere, but uh, you're just increasing complexity, which increases number of bugs which increases costs, increases difficulty of monitoring. Uh, I don't see why it's a simplification, which we need to solve problems. Uh, well, I was yes, I was definitely trying to smuggle safety in there. So <laughs> thank you for catching that. I guess the, the thinking, again, from the outside of the non-specialist is like, well, if you're saying if something's much smarter than us, we just can't outthink it. So mm -hmm. Like it's almost like throwing up your hands, like there's nothing to be done versus like, okay, well, if something's kind of like us, but just a little bit smarter, we can uh, direct that in a constructive manner. Maybe that's the thinking. It's a useful tool. It can help catch certain bugs. It can help in the design process, but I don't think it ever gets you to guarantee the results you want. And the more of those steps you have, where you switch to the next level, to the next level, the more you introduce possibilities for undetected bugs, for side effects and capabilities you didn't anticipate. Yes, well, yeah, and there's no guarantees, that's for sure. Uh, so before we um, leave this, you know, AGI or uh, advanced AI risk issue, is there anything else you wanted to uh, talk about for that? I think we covered it pretty well. I mean, I wish I had some solutions, not just problems, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, problem identification is a key part of problem solution, right? <laughs> or solving problems. So I think, although it's unfortunate, because who doesn't want a solution along with their problem, uh, someone has to do the work of identifying the problem. And it's nice that you're a part of that community. Thanks. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries, or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at trc underscore podcast. Mm -hmm.